You're on parole until 2073, right? You're not looking at a free man in front of you. Another arrest is made in connection with a string of burglaries in the uptown neighborhood of Dallas. Investigators today announced the arrest of Damon West. I learned two things in prison. I learned that adversity is never as bad as you think it's going to be. And prison was a spiritual place for me to grow. And that's what it was. I had a spiritual awakening inside that prison. But we're far from that. Let's get back to the story. This big black guy loves to rape white guys. He does it with a knife and he's HIV positive. That day, and I'm going to murder this guy. And it's self-defense, but I'm going to have to murder him because I don't want him to kill me. I don't want him to rape me and give me AIDS. This is prison, man. Look, I'm going to tell you this. I earned my life sentence. I take it. I earned it. But why did a jury sentence me to 65 years for organized crime for a bunch of property crimes? They were mad at me, Mark. Handcuffed me. They're dragging me out of the courtroom. Happens fast, just like you see in the movies, man. My mom does all the talking. She said, baby, debts in life demand to be paid, and you just got hit with one hell of a bill from the state of Texas. You come back as the man we raised, or don't come back to us at all. What is the scariest moment of your life, and what did you learn in that moment? Scariest moment of my life. So I got, after I got into prison and established myself, it would, this is about two months in. This is in 2010. A couple months into prison, I've established myself, which means I fought for two months for my right to exist in this place. And one of the ways I did that is I played sports out there. I got in the rec yard and I played a lot of sports, played basketball specifically. And in prison, everything is about race. I mean, every sport is segregated by the color of your skin on the license building rec yard. And at the time, when I went out there and started playing basketball, I was still fighting the black gangs because I wanted to be independent. I had to be independent. My mom and my dad made me promise that I would not get into a game. And so I got out there and I started playing basketball with these guys out there. And after about a week of playing basketball, I'd earned the respect. I'd earned the right to exist in there. And every day- Hold on, are you good at basketball? I'm not great at basketball, but I'm a great athlete. I mean, but I can pick up any sport. Um, you know, if you're playing a game of basketball and you're picking 10 guys, I'm probably like your eighth or ninth pick before you, <laughs> you know, you get to playing. But I got out there and played because in prison, everybody respects an athlete. Athleticism is highly valued, highly respected inside prison. And so I was out there playing basketball with these guys. And once I'd earned the respect, they'd come by my cell. They'd bang on 45 cells, say, Wes, let's go shoot some hoops. So one day I was coming off the rec yard. And uh, my cellmate, this little guy named Carlos. Carlos is about five foot four, a little Hispanic guy, a little bank robber from San Antonio, Texas. He was serving 99 years for a bunch of bank jobs. Real good guy, though. Real good guy. So uh, Carlos, I'm coming out the rec yard. He's in the pod. He pulls me aside, and he's real frantic. I can see something's bothering him. I'm like, man, what's up, Carlos? And he said, Wes, when you go to the showers today, Blackjack is going to be in there to rape you. Now, Blackjack is the biggest rapist in prison. This guy is is notorious for the reason why they call him Blackjack is because he likes to jack people for the, I mean, he likes to rape people. That's what he is. He jacks people. Um, He's about six foot six, two, six foot four, 260 pounds. Big black guy, loves to rape white guys. He does it with a knife and he's HIV positive. This guy is like death in several forms. Holy shit. Like, yeah. So Carlos is like, man, hey, Blackjack is coming to rape you today. When you go to the showers. And I'm like, Carlos, that's insane. I said, well, dude, listen, man, I I know I stink, but I'm not going to take a shower today. He said, you're an idiot. He said, you're on the track and the train is coming. He said, I tried to tell you about going out there and playing basketball. You don't belong in that basketball court. But now you got the attention of the biggest rapist in prison. He said, what are you prepared to do? Hold on. Why don't you belong on the basketball court? Because you're a white guy? I'm a white guy. That's it. Okay. And and basketball is for black guys. That's a simple reason. The, the whole rec yard is segregated by the color of your skin. Every sport, sand volleyball was for the whites and Hispanics only. Handball, okay. all the races can play handball. But if you wanted to play doubles and partner up with somebody in handball, your partner had to be the same skin color as you. You can't mix races out there. Say like the, the weight stack. Everybody wants to lift weights in prison, just like you see in prison movies, man. Everybody wants to push that iron. Yeah. All the races can lift weights in prison. But if you wanted to play, if you wanted to have a partner, you wanted someone to spot you, your partner, yeah. your spotter has to be the same skin color. You can't mix the races up. You can't even sit down and eat a meal with someone of a different race at your table and the life's in this building. Race is king. It is everything in there. That's how everybody separates themselves. And so Carlos is telling me, he's like, I told you not to go out there and play basketball, but you did it anyway. You want to earn some respect. You took a shortcut. This is where your shortcut got you. He said, what are you prepared to do? And I'm like, 
Carlos, this dude's got a knife, man. I don't have a knife. Man, Carlos whips a knife out of his pants about this. I don't even know where this little guy's hiding this thing, man. He's a little bitty dude. This knife is about this long, man. He hands okay, me this and knife. For our audio listeners, you're like, you're like. <laughs> it's about a foot long knife. It's a blade. Um, oh <laughs> and a knife in prison is just like anything you see in the movies. It's a piece of steel. It's been sharpened down to a razor's edge. Got a bunch of tape around the handle. And he hands me this blade. I'm holding this blade in my hand. And, and the weight of it, not the weight of the physical weight, but the weight of the situation is weighing down on me. And I hand the knife back to Carlos. I'm like, Carlos, listen, man, I've never fought with a knife before. I don't know how to fight with a knife. This guy's probably been using a knife for 20 years, man. He's going to slice me up. I said, there's got to be another weapon, another way. He said, there is. He said, go to the cell and I'll meet you there in a second. He said, do not leave the cell until I get back there. So I go up to 45 cell and I'm waiting for my cellmate to return. A few minutes later, he comes back and Carlos has got some tools in his hands. Now, in prison in Texas, there's no air conditioning. There's no AC in Texas prisons, it is, and it is hot in Texas, brother. I'm talking about it is burning hot. But instead of an air conditioner, they have these little bitty fans that are supposed to keep you cool. And so Carlos goes and he takes apart my little bitty fan, and he takes the motor out of the center of the fan, a little five-pound motor, man, just a bunch of metal and, and wires coiled up. He cuts the metal out of the fan. He cuts the motor out of the fan, pulls the motor out, and he drops it in this mesh bag that you use for like your shower bag. And he starts swinging the bag around the cell. Oh, it's like a sock full of pennies. He said, this is your weapon today. And what it is, is a medieval weapon. It's a ball and chain flail. I mean, I played Dungeons and Dragons as a kid. I can recognize what this (laughs) is, right? So he's swinging this big, heavy five-pound weight around in this bag. He said, here's what you're going to have to do. So he tells me, he says, go into the shower. So for those of you that are listening, the showers are a single-man shower. You walk in, they have a little change area off to the side, and you go into the shower a little further back, and there's one shower nozzle. He said, go in there and turn the shower water on real hot. He said, then go back and wait in that little change area. And back then, they had these little saloon-type doors on the shower. He said, now, when Blackjack pops his head through the door, hit him in the head as hard as you can with the fan motor. He said, You're- Are you kidding me? This is his plan? This is his plan. This is, the- this is prison, man. He said, the first hit that you hit him with, it's not going to kill him. You're going to stun him. He said, but when you stun him, get on him and don't stop bashing his head till you see his brains come out of his skull. He said, you got to kill this guy today, Damon. He said, because here's what's going to happen. Either he's going to do something to you that you're going to wish you were dead, or you're going to kill him and they're going to give you another life sentence. He said, but the reality of your situation is you're never going to leave prison alive. This is as good as it gets today. He said, are you prepared to go? He said, give me the bag, Carlos. I take the bag with the motor in it. I go to the shower. I do everything he says. I get in the hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry. Real quick though, there is nothing in your upbringing. There's nothing in your past, even though, and we'll get into the story about how you landed in prison. But there's nothing that I know about you as as a violent man, as um, someone who's going to go and, and bludgeon someone to death. Yeah, no, you know no. I mean? Like this isn't you, nothing. is it? <laughs> no, and I've never like set out to kill somebody, but that day. I'm set. I'm going to the shower and I'm going to murder this guy. And I, it, it's self defense, but I'm going to have to murder him because I don't want him to kill me. I don't want him to rape me and give me and give me AIDS. So I mean, it's like I've got to make a choice. And so I told Carlos, "Give me the bag." And it's amazing what you're able to do. I tell people all the time that that I, I learned two things about adversity in prison. I learned that adversity is never as bad as you think it's going to be, and you're always capable of way more than you think you are. Because mm. so many times in life, we allow overthinking to get in the way of overcoming. And so that day I go to the showers, I do everything he says, I get in the little change area and I wait. And I don't know if it's, you know, a minute and a half or two minutes, but here he comes. Blackjack pulls those saloon doors open. And I remember he had this big grin on his face, Mark, and it, and it really pissed me off that he was grinning like that. And I swing back and I hit this guy as hard as he could with that fan, as hard as I could with that fan motor. And I mean, Boom, I hit this dude and he raises up at the last second. Pop him in the chest, loud, sickening thud, and this five-pound motor hitting him. He shoots out like a cartoon character out of a, a cannon and he drops the knife on the ground. And man, I'm on there. I'm, I, we're up on the third tier too, man. I'm bashing this dude with this fan motor. I can't get to his head because he's got his head covered up. So I drop the fan motor. I'm trying to kick his hands off his head because I got to get to his head and bash his brains out. And about that time, Two of his gang brothers have flown. He's a Mandingo warrior. Two of his gang brothers flew up the stairs and they get up there in the third run. And these are guys I play basketball with, by the way. They're like, West, if you lay another hand on this dude, we got to kill you, man. That's just the code in here. We got to kill you if you touch him again because we're here. 
And I'm like, I'm telling him, I said, man, this dude tried to rape me. He's, they're like, dude, he's a rapist. That's what he does. But he's our brother. You can't just kill him, man. You can't kill our brother. He had a weapon. You had a weapon. It's over, man. We're going to let you live. Beat your feet. So I grab my bag with a fan motor in it. I take off and I run to my cell. I shut the cell door and I get on the ground, Mark, and I start crying. Like, I mean, like the adrenaline's burning off and I'm crying. I cannot believe I just went through this moment where I, Mark, I was about to kill this guy, man. And and I I was ready to kill him. And this adrenaline's burning off and I pass out, man. And I remember I woke up and I heard the cell doors rolling and I was famished. I was starving, man, because I mean, this is like that adrenaline burn eats every calorie out of you. I'm hungry and I look around and, and I'm like, I'm going to go to last chow because I, I think they're rolling the doors for last chow. But I see the sunlight coming through the window of her cell. It's the next morning. It's the next morning, man. I passed out for an entire smooth 12 hours, man. And um, I remember looking around. I'm like, okay, this wasn't a dream. It happened. I see the bag over there in the corner with the fan motor. It's got blood all over it. I'm like, oh, sh-. and I'm making, my, making sure it's not my blood. I'm like, I'm not cut. Like he, he's HIV positive, right? But I don't have any cuts on me. There's no wounds on me. I have no blood at all. That's his blood. So I get up. I'm like, okay, I got to go out there and face this. And I don't know what's going to happen. When they roll the cell door, I don't know what's gonna, if someone's going to come stab me or what, but I can't hide myself forever. And so I walk out that cell door that morning. And I mean, prison was an entire different place because I never had to fight again, Mark, because everybody in that prison saw that I spoke the only language everybody speaks in prison, and that is violence, man. In a maximum security prison, either you speak violence or someone speaks it to you, but you have to become fluent in the language of violence. And that day, they saw that I was ready to take another man's life, and they never bothered me again. Blackjack, he never bothered me again either, man. He'd give me some mean looks every now and then, but he is a predator. Predators look for the weakest prey. It's like in nature movies, man, nature series TV. You see the lion always gets the last gazelle, right? Or the last zebra. All you have to do is be faster than that last zebra, that last gazelle. But everybody that's a predator is looking for the easy prey. So he didn't want to have a problem with me again. He's going to look for somebody he can prey on that's not going to bash his head in with a fan motor. And no one ever bothered me again. Prison was an entire different place. And that's when I started working on myself. That's when I started becoming that coffee bean because when the violence was over, the threat to my physical safety was gone. I had to figure it out how to be a coffee bean, brother. Holy smokes. I mean, (laughs) I'm so glad I asked that question. (laughs) Is that your typical first question to answer? (laughs) No, I thought you were going to talk about flash grenades going off or getting cuffed and laying on the floor or having to face your mom. And I want to get into all of these hard lessons you've learned. But yeah, that makes all that seem pretty easy, man. That makes yeah. SWAT team didn't compare to blackjack, man. SWAT team was scary, man. The SWAT team rate was incredible. Uh, Yeah. It's meant to disorient you and all that, but. Okay, so let's get into that now because you mentioned Coffee Bean a few times. It's um, it's such a great story. So let's unpack this for everyone who's watching and listening along. Let's go back. So you are, um, you know, you're raised in a great family. You, uh, you're a college football player. Uh, you have the opportunity to work uh, at like the state house with some people and on a presidential campaign. And um, uh, you were in training to be a stockbroker or work on the stock market and banking. Like, like you have, you're a white straight guy in America. Like, I mean, like you got things going your way. I don't understand yeah. how you wind up in prison with a 65 year uh, uh, conviction. So the easiest answer is substance abuse. But it really goes back to my belief systems. Or your belief systems are so important, Mark, because your belief systems tell you how to think, how to respond, how to behave. And when you have bad belief systems, they cause you to act and behave and think in a bad way. And your belief systems, they form early on in life. And here's the deal about belief systems. Belief systems are very difficult to change, especially bad belief systems. And the longer you hold on to a belief system, the harder it is to get rid of. In fact, here's the truth. Bad belief systems usually win in the end. They're very difficult to change. I went to a prison, man, and I saw a lot of people that had bad belief systems and they weren't ready to change. Even after going to prison, that wasn't going to be the impetus for their change. But for me, it was. And I had to figure out how to change my belief systems once I got inside that prison. But in on July 30th, 2008, I'm sitting on this little ratty old couch in this little rundown apartment in Dallas. And I'm a guy that's full of bad belief systems because I'm the head of an organized crime ring that's been operating in the city of Dallas for three years. I'm the top criminal on the criminal period. I'm the shot caller of the entire group. And I'm sitting on the couch today with my dope dealer. His name is Tex. And I'm telling Tex as we're passing this pipe back and forth, Tex, you don't want to be here right now. The cops are closing in on me. The end is near. 
10 days before, this guy that was doing all these burglaries within Dallas, this guy named Dustin, my partner in crime, Dustin had been picked up by the Dallas Police Department in a stolen car. So, Mark, they got my partner in crime in custody. I know it's just a matter of time before they get to me. And just well, as well, I, what do you with all these B and E's and stuff? Like, what are you stealing? I often think of of the risk and the work and the reward. And it's like in the old days, you know, you watch the old movies in the eighties and nineties. People are stealing VCRs and stuff to sell them secondhand. But in like, what are you stealing that you can actually get money for meth for or whatnot? Like, why is it worth it? Oh yeah, I mean, it just it, is it? the <laughs> fact that you're a meth addict. You know, theft and meth go together like rats and trash. That's okay. an axiom. You can take that to the bank, man. So when we're breaking into these places, first of all, there's about a dozen other meth addicts, young and old, male and female, black and white, everything in between, because drugs and addiction don't discriminate. But we broke into the homes of dozens and dozens of people to feed our insatiable meth habits. Because when we're breaking into these houses, we're taking things like jewelry, like appliances, like uh but I mean, like it, appliances, like refrigerators, everything, man, furniture. I mean, we're wiping these places out because we're, I've got different meth dealers that'll, you know, trade for dope. And that's what the whole thing was about. Oh, you didn't have to take the stuff, sell it, take the cash and go buy stuff. Like, you no, could, I, had you could... dope, I had dope dealers that wanted different oh. stuff. In fact, they knew that I was a serial burglar and they knew that I had this burglary crew that was getting into the nicest part of Dallas. And they put out like requests. Hey, if you ever come across a living room set. I need a living room set or a sub zero. <laughs> like, so they were actually like looking for things the way that like, I think of like uh, chop shops might go like, Oh man, you know, the a fours are really great. Cause the cats are worth blah, blah, blah. Like, like they're putting out calls where it's like, Oh man, I could really use a six piece, uh, uh, a, a dining room set made of uh, maple with a buffet on the end. <laughs> right. Cause think about it, man, you're, you've got a dope dealer and you know, well, you want to talk about entrepreneurs? Man, I was locked up with a lot of drug dealers. These people, they can become very good entrepreneurs if you can put them in the right lane to do it in. Something legal, something good. Yeah. Because let me tell you what a dope dealer does. A dope dealer takes a quantity of dope. Let's say it's meth. They'll take, let's say, it, an ounce of meth, and they'll break it up into different little segments to sell. And they know exactly which baggie they break even when they break it up. Then they know the next baggie that they're going to make enough profit to buy a second batch. Then they know the next baggie they're going to make to buy a third batch and a fourth batch and a fifth batch. Dope dealers are, for all of its purposes, they're like entrepreneurs, but in a bad way. I mean, they're out there and they understand the business model of I have a stock of a supply. I've got to sell this supply and I've got to go out and then I got to buy more because the demand becomes higher and higher, right? But these dope dealers, they're connected into all these different parts of the underworld and organized crime throughout every city in America. And so when a dope dealer tells me, hey, Damon, if you come across a sub-zero fridge, bring that to me. That's a $15,000 refrigerator, by the way, man. Yeah, so, yeah, no, I know. I've been looking into one. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so, and I found them. I mean, I'd find them all the time. I'd find, you know, but it, if you find one of those, bring it to me, I'll give you some dope for it because that dope dealer has other people he or she is selling it too. I don't know uh. who the people are, but they're moving. They've started an appliance store on the side. You see what I'm saying? They're an entrepreneur that started out in the dope world, and now they're basically running a pawn shop on the side. They've got oh, all this and other can, stuff. And going. then they can do. They can take the stuff. Yeah, and all low the cost, for and then clean, clean the, clean the money. Absolutely, man. But low cost in the sense that it, they paid for it with dope, which is already the profit margin because they'd already sold enough dope to buy the next batch. Now yeah. they're dealing with pure profit over here. That's their investment money. They're taking so what made in. you, as the leader of this micro ring, what made you so good at that? Um, I don't know. I don't know that good is the charge. Well, I guess, like, here's the deal. Well, you were the leader. I mean, like, I'm the leader, you, like, and, you and had we, the connections, you had the network. Like, there must have been some inherent skill set or something you brought to it that made you not just one of the other 15 meth yeah, so you know, heads following everyone else. I mean, here's the deal. I, Everybody has this preservation of life instinct. No one wants to get caught. And even though I'm out in the dope world and I'm spun out of control, I don't want to get caught. I don't want to go down. And so, look, man, one of the first burglaries I did, I broke into a U.S. post office and I stole a mailman uniform, mailman bag, mailman hat, the whole thing. And that was the disguise that I used to scope out and check out neighborhoods, condo buildings, stuff like that. You can't tell me what your mailman looks like. No one knows what the mailman looks like. 
And so the mailman uniform gave me a good cover to go around checking out places, checking out the security in different places. Um, but some of the things, some of the different things that, you know, came up with that we could do to figure out where we're going to break into is some of these buildings in, in uptown Dallas, they had these mail kiosks inside these condos and the mail kiosk looks like this. It's got four walls. One of the walls has a door. The other three walls is all the little boxes that you have your individual key to open that box. But that door, if you can get in the other side of that door, which I can pick locks inside that room is all these different holes and boxes of all those. Yeah, mail it's, all, slots. It's, it's the back. It's the back end of all the slots, That's right? right? So you and open one door and you have access to all of them. All of them. And then you see mail stacked up in one of these boxes, right? That person's not home. They haven't checked their mail in a week or so. Well, sometimes you see a note that says out of town from this state to this state, hold our mail. And that is how I'm picking out some of the times how I'm picking out how I'm going to break into places. And um, then, you know, we had a box truck. I had a box truck and had a bunch of other dope fiends dressed up in dicky overalls. A guy walking around with a clipboard. We looked like a moving company. People would let us in. I mean, people would get the gate for us at these condo buildings when you're wiping out their neighbor's place. So I tried to apply everything I could, Mark, to not get caught. I would take some of the stolen because you get into these places, you find out people are out of town. One of the first things I'm going to look for when I go into these condo buildings or whatever is the key fob to the vehicle that's likely left behind. And if I can find that spare key fob, I just go in the parking garage and I hit the button until I heard the boop. And then I would take that luxury car, uh, fill it with things you don't want to keep from a burglary, checkbook, credit cards, uh, laptops, things that can be traced back to it, throw them in the back seat of that car. Have my partner in crime, Dustin, follow me to some of the worst neighborhoods in Dallas. And I'd find a busy street corner. Maybe there's a car wash and people are hanging out at the car wash on a, on a weekend. I'd pull up in that $100,000 car, that Mercedes, that Land Rover, that Beamer, pull up to that really, really busy street corner, window rolled down, music blaring, engine running, get out of the car, go across the street, get in Dustin's car and leave that car running right there. Now, I don't know how long those cars would last out there, maybe five minutes maybe 10 minutes before jump, someone jumps in the car and says, man, there's a car with a key in it. Oh, look in the back. There's credit cards. There's checkbook. Let's go buy some stuff. That is what we use as a diversion tactic in some of the cases. And But ultimately, in the end, it would be the cars that did us in because Dustin, of course, was caught with one of the stolen cars. But I want to stress this when we're talking about the burglary, because I've talked about all this stuff in the book that I wrote called The Change Agent. But I want to stress this, that my victims, when I broke into people's homes, I didn't just steal their property, brother. I stole something way more valuable from my victims. I stole their sense of security. And I do not think my victims will ever get that back. So there's no glory in the stuff that I'm telling you how we did it. I'm just telling you, matter of factly, you asked me the question, how did, how were you successful? How were you able to do this for so long? Uh, and it's because I tried to apply everything I could to not get caught. And some of that is using diversion. Some of that is using, um, you know, costumes, disguises, whatever part of Dallas I was in. If I was in the medical district, I'd wear scrubs. If I was in uptown, I'd dress up, you know, real preppy and like all the other people there. I was kind of a ghost, Mark. And that's how I think I got away with it for so long. You know, Jordan Peterson talks about in 12 Rules to Life that um, often it's not what people have done, which they struggle with as years go on. You know, he asks, how can German citizens have done so many horrible things during World War II? How can anyone in war have done so many horrible things? How can you, as a drug addict and someone who's really, as you mentioned, like broken into all these homes, taking away people's peace, taking away their security, having them feel violated, um, often it's not the acts that people struggle with. It's reconciling that they're capable of those acts. It's living with the fact that you had done it, if you know what I mean. Like, how can I be the type of person to do it? Did you have to struggle with that as you spend time in prison or, um, kind of, you know, now you're a speaker, now you write about this, now you talk about it again, not with glory, but how did you reconcile that you did all these things? Yeah, I mean, this is like, this is working out. <laughs> What I had to do is I had to get into a program recovery and, and I got into AA. That's the program recovery. I mean, it's a 12 step program recovery. I'm, I'll do it for the rest of my life. But I had to figure out in a program recovery, I had to basically figure out how to keep my side of the street clean. And in the program recovery, 
you're going to work these different steps. They call them the 12 steps in there. And the fourth step, you write down all your resentments, all your fears. And these are the things you got to get out. And the biggest resentment that I had was against myself. And I had to figure out how to reconcile that because I, I look back on it and Mark, it's hard to believe in my mind that I'm the guy that did all those things to all those other people, uh, my victims. Because I look, I'm today in this life, uh, I've got a family, I've got a wife, I've got a stepdaughter, I mean, I've got a home. I can't imagine someone doing to me what I did to all those other people. But I know that for sure that the guy that did that to those people is not the Damon West you see today. That was a guy that was strung out on meth. And I know that addiction addicts typically aren't bad people, Mark. They're sick people that do bad things. And addiction is a very selfish and very ugly thing. And that someone, when they're the disease of addiction, they're capable of doing just about anything to get what they want. Now, I had a line that I drew where it wasn't going to go beyond committing property crimes. And I did everything I could to make sure my victims were never home. Uh, that was the only consolation I can tell you is that I, no one was ever home during my burglaries. I never saw my victims. They never saw me. No one got hurt. No weapons were ever used. And that's one of the reasons why when I came up for parole, I was eligible because my crimes were nonviolent. Nobody was physically hurt during the commission of these crimes. But it doesn't lessen the severity of the fact that I hurt people in different ways. And working a program recovery, you get to the eighth step. The eighth step is where you make a list of all the people that you've harmed. And the ninth step is where you're willing to make amends to all those people that you've harmed, except when to do so would cause you or them more harm. Now, in the state of Texas, they have a law. The state of Texas says that no one convicted of a crime can ever reach out to their victims and apologize. Now, that's mainly a rule, I think, made for violent crimes because, you know, if someone that's a victim of a violent crime, you don't necessarily want someone reaching out to you and saying, I'm sorry, uh, after they've done it to you. But it applies to all crimes. So here's the deal, Mark. I'll never be able to apologize to my victims and I'll never do it because if I apologize to my victims means I'm going back to prison, I'm not doing it. I'm never going to apologize to my victims because I'm not allowed to in the state of Texas. But what they say in the program recovery is that when you get to a ninth step and the amends would cause you or someone else harm, here's what you do. You make a living amends. And a living amends means instead of making that apology to that person that you've harmed, you go out and do good deeds. And you just do these good deeds for the rest of your life. And that is how you get that resentment, that, that loathing that you feel of yourself. That's how you get that off of your back. You don't have to carry that around anymore because you can say every time you go around, you do a good deed. That was for the stuff I did back there to that person that I'll never be able to apologize to. So that's what I had to do. Part of being a coffee bean is working that program recovery and, and going out and look for ways. I call it servant leadership. Servant leadership is helping other people reach their goals, right? And I look, just look for every way, ways to help people every day. I got this prayer that I pray every morning that keeps me in line with that. I get up in the morning. It's a two-part prayer. I started saying it in prison in 2011. And I asked God for two things in the morning, Mark. I say, hey, God, put in front of me what you need me to do today for you. And let me recognize that when I see it, because I don't want to miss whatever that is. And that's it, man. Amen. That's my prayer every day. That's all I pray for every day. I don't ask for things I think I want or need. I got to trust that yeah, I'm a Christian. So you can believe whatever you want too, by the way. No one can tell you what to believe in. So, but, but in my faith, I believe that, it, that first of all, I believe Christ knows what I want. So I don't have to sit there and ask for these things. And that if I take care of what he needs me to do for him, he'll take care of my needs too. Not my wants but my needs. My need is to be a complete human being and be the best person possible every single day. And that's what keeps me sober. That's what keeps me being a coffee bean. That's what keeps me free from going back to prison. And I say free from going back to prison, Mark, because you're not looking at a free man in front of you. Those of y'all that you're, are watching You're on this, parole until 2073, right? Yeah, that 2073, 50 years. 2073, for, for when I heard I'm that missed. number, when I heard that number, um, it, like it didn't compute for me even. I was like 2073. Like I can't even think that far ahead. It blows people away. But I mean, that's the reality. Hey, you know what? That's for, that's the time I got to do. I did the crime. I've got to do the time. And but let me tell you something I'm not worried about. I'm not worried about parole. I'm a coffee bean, Mark. And as long as I'm a coffee bean, that means I'm going to make good choices. <laughs> 
And the only way I'm going back to prison is when I go to prisons all over this country, man. I share this story with the men and women in there to bring them hope on their journey because hope is a thing everybody must have. And I walk out the front gate of all my prisons today, Mark. Okay, so you've mentioned a whole bunch of times that you're a coffee bean. Uh, I love this. So if you're listening, if you're watching, if you don't know what we're talking about, like, like pay attention right now. Damon, what is a coffee bean? What the hell are you talking about? How did you come across this? Yeah. Uh, so right after I was sentenced to life in prison, uh, May 18th, 2009, this is the day that it happened. I go to trial and uh, the jury sentenced me to 65 years, which is life in Texas. Anything 60 and above is a life sentence in the state of Texas. So the jury gets it only took them 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes of deliberation. After six days of trial, a week long trial, they yeah. do deliberate. Excuse me. They so, go deliberate for 10 minutes. This means you're guilty as hell, basically. Yeah, this means you're and I knew that they had me. I mean, I, I sat through the entire trial, too. I mean, the evidence was overwhelming of my guilt of being the ringleader of a bunch of other meth addicts breaking into people's houses. The question was, how long were they going to give me in 10 minutes? The answer was obvious. They were going to max me out. And they did. So they gave me life. And right after the trial was over. The sheriff is on me. The bailiff is on me. They handcuff me. They're dragging me out of the courtroom. Happens fast, just like you see in the movies, man, especially when you get a life sentence, man. They're getting me out of there. I lock eyes with my mom on the way out. I'm like, mom, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They whisk me out of there. They put me in this little side room. It's got a bulletproof glass. They told me to wait. A few minutes later, my mom and my dad were being escorted in on the other side of the glass. They have decided to give my parents one last visit with me before I go to prison. They feel sorry for my parents because I just got life. Now, my dad can't talk. He is in stunned disbelief that his son, who once had all this promise in life, just received a life sentence in prison. So my mom does all the talking. She said, baby, she said, debts in life demand to be paid. And you just got hit with one hell of a bill from the state of Texas. She said, but you did everything they said you did, Damon. So you're going to have to go and pay that debt to society. She said, because you owe Texas that debt. But you owe your father and I debt, too. She said, we gave you all the opportunity love and support to be anything you want to be in life. And that's how you just repaid us what we saw in that courtroom. That's not going to work. We raised you in Port Arthur, Texas, a giant melting pot of a city. We gave you a great moral compass, which you chose to not use. She said, so here's the debt you're going to pay to us. When you go to prison, you will not get in one of these white hate groups, one of these Aryan Brotherhood type of gangs, because you're scared because you're the minority in there. She said, it's not going to work. You were never raised to be a racist. You're not going to start now. She said, you will not get any tattoos while you're inside that prison. She said, no gangs, no tattoos. She said, you come back as the man we raised or don't come back to us at all. Man, I was... Now, I, hold on. I have to imagine in that moment, based off of all of your past actions, all of your past decisions, everything that you did, she was saying goodbye to you, wasn't she? She like she must have known like this one last ditch effort. I'm a father. Um I have to imagine she was like, don't come back at all because she knew that she would never see you again, right? No, I think that she was... No, I know for sure because I've asked her about this moment um, because my mom's a nurse. And I asked her, I said, what were you thinking whenever this conversation, what was going through your mind? How did you get that thought to come out? She said, Damon, I view everything as a nurse. And so what I saw is that my son is lying on a gurney and he's bleeding out and dying. And she said, I'm doing triage at that point. And she said, when you're doing triage, you're just trying to save a life. She said, the only thing I can think to do to save you in this moment is to give you this giant ultimatum because otherwise you're dead anyway, you know? So it's when you're doing triage, you just, man, you do what you have to do. And that's what came to her is to do that. Because for her, it was like the, I mean, look, and let's be honest, Mark. I mean, what are the odds that I'm gonna come out of prison in the shape that I'm in right now, you know? What are the odds I'm gonna walk out of here like that? I don't have a tattoo on me, man. I don't have any tats. I don't, I don't have any physical signs that shows that I was in there. And emotionally and spiritually, man, I went into a, I basically went into a cocoon, man. I went, I came in, I went in a caterpillar and came out a butterfly. I grew more in that seven years and three months that I was in prison than the first 33 years that I was on this earth, man. Prison was a spiritual place for me to grow. And that's what it was. I had a spiritual awakening inside that prison. But we're far from that. Let's get back to the story. So she's telling me no gangs, no tattoos. She said, you come back as the man we raised or don't come back at all. And Mark, I'm floored. I'm stunned. that My mom has just told me this. And she says, do you understand this debt you're going to pay to us? I was like, 
Yeah, I got it. But what do I know about prison, Mark? I'm a white middle class guy in America, man. I don't know, but it's been to prison, brother. I get back to my pod in Dallas County Jail. I got two months before the prison bus comes to pick me up. And I'm asking every guy that's been to prison before, how am I going to survive? What am I going to do? And every guy I talk to, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, they all said the same thing. You got to get into a gang. They said you won't survive without a gang. They said the gang is your family now. So you spent 10 months in, in county while you were going through trial and stuff. Is it different than prison? Like, because you said, oh, I've never been to prison before, but like mm. the time you spent in jail, that's different than prison? Very different. Jail is where you go while you're awaiting to get your guilty or in, guilt innocence uh, decision made. And prison is when you go when you're guilty of something. So that's the difference between jail and prison. Jail is where you go before you're guilty of something. Prison is where you go after you're guilty of something. So, and that time in jail didn't prepare you for maximum security prison in Texas. No, and I'll tell you, one of the biggest differences between jail and prison is that jail is a very transient place. There's a lot of people that come in and out of the jail. You know, some people may go to jail and they spend five days in there. Some people may go in there and they spend two years in there waiting to go to their trial. Some people bond out. Some people stay in. Some people sit around and wait out their time so they don't have to pay their fine. Jail is a very transient place. And typically in a jail, man, people aren't trying to cause any serious trouble because they have something they're waiting to be decided on and they don't want to have that tacked on to what they're waiting on anyway, right? They don't want to create more problems for themselves. So typically in a jail, you don't have the kind of people that are in there for a long time. You don't have people in there for life. They don't have lifers inside of a jail. In jail, it's a very transient place. And if people try to like stay out of each other's way to just get along in there, because they're not there for the long stay. Prison? Prison is home, man. Prison is where you're going to live. Some people for the rest of their lives. Other people for 10, 15, 20 years. Prison is where you go when you get into a routine. Prison is where you go where you're not going to have your family out there anymore in a lot of cases. Because in jail, a family, people can stick with you in jail. They see an end to it. But in prison, when you see people get to prison, that's when the, the letters start coming in saying, hey, you know, this is over, this is done. That's when guys start getting these, uh, they get called out to the go to the law library, get a legal mail, and then legal mail is a divorce summons. You're never going to see me or your kid again. Those are the things that start happening in a prison, the things that start pulling you away from the world that you once lived in. Prison is a very different place than jail because prison is where you live your life, and you have to get into a routine in prison. That. It's easier to do time in a prison, by the way, than it is to do time in a county jail, simply because in prison, you have a life, you have a routine, you have a job that you go to every day, you have friends that you make in there, you get into a routine in there and you start working on yourself and that becomes your life because you're going to live wherever you are, but in jail, it's hard to get into a routine. Time goes mm -hmm. by real slow in a jail. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So, so, so you're out of jail. You've been, con you've been convicted and you have the chance now to prep for prison, which is this whole new world. Yeah. And I'm freaked out by it because I mean, everybody's telling me I have to get into a gang, but there was this one guy, this old black man in Dallas County jail, old guy named Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jackson, this old black Muslim guy, man. He had a smile on his face everywhere he went. He pulls me aside one day. He's like, Hey, listen, West, you want to keep that promise you made to your mom and your dad? And let me tell you what prison is really going to be like. So he said, the first thing you need to understand about prison, he said, prison is all about race. Race runs the entire institution. He said, because the inmates want it to be about race. He said, when you walk in the door of the life sentence building, the white gangs get the first dibs on you because you are white. The Aryan Brotherhood, the Aryan Circle, the White Knights, the Woods, he starts naming all these white prison gangs. He said, you got to fight them all if you want to be independent from them. He said, if you don't give in to their ideology of hate, out of fear, then get ready. Because now you're going to fight the black gangs. And the white gangs, by the way, will send the black gangs after you. And the black gangs, the Crips, the Bloods, the Gangster Disciples, the Mandingo Warriors, they're going to be happy to tee off on this independent white guy that won't get with his own race and his own kind. He said, but West, if you survive all that and you can survive all that, you will earn the right to walk alone. He said, the strongest man in prison always walks alone, does not join a gang. He told me the truth about fight. He said, you don't even have to win all your fights, Wes, but you do have to fight all your fights. He said, some days you're going to win and some days you're going to lose. He said, it's okay to lose, Wes, as long as you get back up and keep fighting. That's what he's telling me. Just get back up, keep fighting. But man, what he's telling me is, Mark, back in 2009, 
I'm looking back at this guy like a deer in headlights, all those violence and terror about to walk into. That's what he's like, Wes, let me break it down for you a different way. He said, I want you to imagine prison as a pot of boiling water. He said, anything we put into this pot of boiling water will be changed by the heat and the pressure inside this pot. I'm going to put three things in this pot of boiling water that we call prison and watch how they change. A carrot, an egg, and a coffee bean. So here's where I first heard the story of the coffee bean, Mark. The summer of 2009 in Dallas County Jail, exactly 10 years before John Gordon and I write the best-selling book in the summer of 2019 called The Coffee Bean. So he said, first things first, Wes, he said, if I put a carrot in the pot of boiling water we call prison, he said, what happened to the carrot? And I'm like, Mr. Jackson, the carrot's going to turn soft. He said, that's right, Wes. He said, but the carrot went into the water hard, firm. But the prison, the water turned the hard carrot soft mushy, weak. The carrot got beat. He got robbed. He may have gotten killed. He said, you don't want to be the carrot. He said, what about the egg, West? What happened to the egg in the pot of boiling water we call prison? And I'm like, Mr. Jackson, the egg is going to turn hard, man, like a hard-boiled egg. He said, that's right, West. He said, the egg has a shell that protects it physically, but inside that shell, that soft, liquid core, the egg's heart becomes hardened. He said, now, if your heart becomes hardened, you become incapable of giving or receiving love. He said, if you're incapable of giving or receiving love, you have become institutionalized and you will not come back as someone your parents recognize because your eggshell will have swastika statued all over it. Then he asked me the question. He said, what about the coffee bean, West? What happened to the coffee bean in the pot of boiling water we call prison? Mark, I didn't have an answer for him now. I didn't know what happened to a coffee bean in a pot of boiling water. He makes coffee. (laughs) Yeah, what I didn't know. I didn't know that's what happens. He said the coffee bean, Wes, in the same pot of boiling water we call prison, changes the pot of boiling water into a pot of coffee. He said because the power is inside the coffee bean to change the water around it. He said the coffee bean was the only thing that will change the water. Carrots are changed by the water. Eggs are changed by the water. He said not the coffee bean. The coffee bean changed the water because it is the change agent. And he's telling me, he said, everybody in life, we all put our energy negative or positive energy, whatever kind of energy we put out, we attract back the law of attraction. So he's telling me, if you want to survive prison, you want to come back as someone your parents recognize, you got to be a coffee bean. That's the only way you're going to survive. And man, man, the the last words he ever said to me, man, there's four of them. Be a coffee bean. That's it, man. And I remember where I was. Is, is, this a re- is this a real story? Like it sounds, Absolutely. it sounds like the old wise black man who's like, you know, in the Disney movie, who's yeah. like changing everything. Like, is this real? Yeah, no, it's absolutely real. In fact, the guy's <laughs> real name is James Lynn Baker. I found him after I got out of prison, started a scholarship in his name, found his family and everything You're else. Not Mr. Man. Jackson? No, I call him Mr. Jackson for the sake of the story. His real name is James Lynn Baker II. Uh, James Lynn Baker II died on May 9th, 2017, of an opiate overdose. Um, he was a drug addict, just like me. But he had this powerful story of the coffee bean, but that, there's kind of the warning in there too, if you want to get really deeper into it. Yeah, let's this guy it. lived his life knowing the story of the coffee bean, but you can have all the knowledge in the world. If you can't apply that knowledge, the knowledge does you no good. All the education in the world does you no good if you can't apply that education. He had this story of the coffee bean, but he passed it on to another guy in Dallas County Jail in 2009. And that one person was able to take this message and apply it into his life and now spread the message all over the world. So when I found out who he, when I found him, when I got out of prison, I eventually found him. I got in touch with his family and I started a scholarship out in his name. It's called the James Lynn Baker II Be a Coffee Bean Scholarship. And at his old high school, because he's from the inner city of Dallas Lincoln High School, every year, one little boy or one little girl that comes out of his neighborhood that goes to his high school gets a $10,000 scholarship, a better chance at life through an education that I provide every year because of these two guys having this chance encounter in Dallas County Jail and back in the summer of 2009. So yeah, it's an absolutely real story. Found his family. It's great. It's an incredible story. His mother was the first licensed black daycare owner in Dallas history. 1948, she opens the first black daycare in Dallas. You know, it it just comes from a phenomenal family. But, you know, drug addiction, back to drugs, man. Addicts aren't bad people. They're sick people that do bad things. He lived his whole life in addiction and in and out of prison his entire life. So knowing this story, what is it like, you know, when you're dropped off at, at on day one at the gate and you got to go through intake and you got to look around and it's new smells and it's new sounds and you have no idea what the fuck is going on. Um, 
you know, and then two months later, you're now, you know, having to fight some guy off from raping you and all of this stuff. Like, I know that this North Star of being the coffee bean was there, but how did you practice this in the first few months? Or at what point did it become something where you're like, Okay, this, like, because you almost have to prove to yourself, I imagine, that sure. this is not gotta, just some folksy story of some black guy. No, you got to physically survive what you're going into. Mark, Mark, prison was the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. It was the most dangerous thing I've ever been through in my life. Prison is a very violent, dangerous place. It, that The threat of violence is the glue that holds the whole place together, man. The threat of violence is always there. And Jackson told me what to expect when I first got there. He said, you know, look. He said, when you walk in the door, you're going to be approached first by a white guy because you're white. He said, the first guy is not a threat to you. He's an information gatherer. He's a scout. He's going to ask you one relevant question, that first conversation. What gang do you want to be a part of? And he said, get him out of your face as fast as you can and get your head on a swivel. Get ready. Because the second guy comes up to you, he's not coming to talk to you. He's coming to hurt you. He's an enforcer. The second guy, when he gets within range, put your fist in. He said, hit this guy as hard as you can when he walks up to you. Don't even let him get a word out. And that's exactly how it went down. The first day that I get to this maximum security level five, the Mark Styles unit in, in Beaumont, Texas. Mark, it's one of the toughest prisons in Texas. It's one of the toughest prisons in America. And let me tell you something. I can tell you a lot about tough prisons in America because since I got out of prison over seven years ago, I went back to school and got a master's in criminal justice and became an adjunct professor at the University of Houston downtown teaching a class called Prisons in America. The only professor on earth who teaches a prisons class that lived in a prison himself. So I know a lot about tough prisons and styles. Styles is hard as to get it. rocking and rolling from day one, man. They get you there. They get you off this bus. First of all, you're chained to another human being. The intake bus comes into the prison. They let you out. They unshackle you. They strip you down. They check you for any anything you might be transported in from county jail. Handcuff keys, dope, whatever. You sit in this chair that x-rays your ass to make sure there's nothing up your butt, right? You sit in this other chair that puts your mouth on this x-ray machine. And they have this thing. It circles around to make sure you're not hiding a handcuff key or something inside your jaws, right? And then you put your clothes back on. They give you your prison outfit. You put your clothes on. You get all your supplies, you get your mattress, you get everything else, your sheets, and then they walk you down to the building where you're going to spend the rest of your life. Seven building was for me. Seven building, the Mark Styles unit is where all the lifers go, Mark. Seven building has 432 people on it. Everybody's got life. In Texas, when you get a life sentence, you're segregated from the rest of the prison population for five years because they want you to get escaping off of your mind. But this place where they segregate you to this one building that everybody's got life, it is the most dangerous island you're ever going to go to. Because can we talk about the, sorry, can we talk about the obvious question is like, how the hell do you get a life sentence for breaking in and stealing some property? Like, I know you did a lot of it. Yeah. Um, I know it was wrong, but it's like for most people in the world, maybe not in Texas, maybe not in America, but for most people in the world, such a punishment for a nonviolent crime seems baffling. It's insane. It's a, in America, we sentence people for two different reasons at trial. We sentence people because we're either afraid of them or we are mad at them. And Dallas County, they were mad at me. They're not, <laughs> they weren't afraid of me. I mean, I'm not a, a violent guy, as you know. I mean, I, I did a lot of bad things. And look, I'm going to tell you this. I earned my life sentence. That's fine. I take it. I earned it. But why did a jury sentence me to 65 years for organized crime for a, a bunch of property crimes? They were mad at me, Mark. And I get why they were mad at me. I understand why a jury could be mad at me because they're looking across the table at this privileged white guy that had it all, man. I came from a great family. I was a Division One college starting quarterback. I worked in the United States Congress. I worked for a guy running for president. I worked on Wall Street, man. I had everything going for me. This jury, these 12 men and women are looking at me like, dude, you had all of that and now you're sitting in this courtroom because you became a drug addict? But a lot of times in life, we don't understand addiction, man. They're looking at a guy and the DA, I mean, the DA's job is to present the case the way they want to present it. And the way they presented the case is that it's not around drugs. This guy is a kingpin. He's Tony Soprano. That's what they, Tony Soprano or Al Capone. These are two different words they used at my trial. I know that you have no control over this, but yeah. in every other, like, like I'm Canadian. I have to think, now this is not an expert at all, it's totally anecdotal, but from what I understand, like you might have gotten like six years here, yeah. uh, eight years, you would have been out on the street in two years with parole. Like, Mark, like, there were guys I was locked up with in prison that did 300 burglaries, but did it in a low-income part of Dallas, and they got five years probation out of the deal. 
I mean, this one guy, uh, what was his name? Corey, man. Corey did probably 300 burglaries in uh, a low-income part of Dallas. He got five years probation. He didn't complete the probation. And when he came back after he violated, they ended up giving him like 60 years. But his first punishment, because of the neighborhood he was breaking in, they didn't give him a serious offense. They weren't worried about that neighborhood. But when you're breaking in to the highest level of places, the, the white middle and upper class part of Dallas, you get the attention of a lot of people that want to make an example out of you. And look, I I always stick with this. I did it. I did everything they said I did. I earned my life sentence. But is a life sentence too much for property crimes? You bet your ass it is, man. (laughs) But you know what? You know who else? But you know who told me that too? In a subtle way, the parole board. When I went to go see parole seven years and three months into my sentence, now I'm eligible for parole, Mark. But I don't think I'm going to make parole. No one makes their first parole, not seven years. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll do 10 or 15 years on my life sentence. But the lady from parole was interviewing me, and she asked me that poison pill question that you don't want to get asked in a parole hearing. Do you think you got too much time? Now, Mark, think about where I'm sitting in this hot seat, man. If I answer that question and say, yeah, likelihood is they're going to say, well, you haven't accepted responsibility for the things you did. Why don't you sit around a couple more years in prison and think about what you did? Or if I say, no, they gave me exactly what I deserve. They're like, okay, good. Do some more time on that then because you're sitting right where you need to be. So I told the lady, I said, ma'am, I don't feel comfortable answering that question. And I gave her the two reasons why. If I do it over here, this is what can happen. If I do it over there, this is what you could think. She said, I'll answer the question for you, Mr. West. You got too much time. So that's coming from the Texas parole board, man. That is, I mean, think about why they let a guy out of parole on parole at seven years and three months on a 65 year sentence. I've got 58 years left when I walk out of prison on parole, but they recognize that the jury gave me too much time. I mean, yeah, it, you're like 10, you're like 10% into your sentence, <laughs> it's, but it's, it's insane that you punish someone that's I, there's people. This is when it gets annoying to me. And it, look, I, I got. Like I live in a program of recovery. I got no resentments. I don't, there's no way that I can have a resentment against the jury for doing their job, the judge for doing his job. None of that stuff. I did the crime. I'll do the time. I get it. But when it gets annoying is when you see someone commit heinous crimes and they get like five years or, or probation or 10 years or 20 years. They don't get 65 years, man. And they, they've messed around with women or children. They've killed somebody. They've taken somebody off the planet, you know, 65 years. You know, that's a whole different, uh, it's, it's wild, man. But you know what? The thing about it in life that I tell people all the time, and when I talk about this in, in front of audiences is that you take your adversity in life and you turn that into an opportunity. The biggest, your biggest liabilities in life can become your best assets in life. The things you think might disqualify you to help other people might be the things that actually qualify you to help someone else. Because in my story, I've got a life sentence and I'm out there living a life on parole that few people, even that haven't gone to prison, get to live. Mark, I go all over the entire globe sharing this story, the coffee bean, empowering other people to know that the power is inside them, not the world around them. And I'm on parole for the rest of my life. Every time I leave the state of Texas, Mark, I've got to get permission from the state of Texas. Every single trip. I've gone on over 350 trips in the last six years outside the state of Texas. And every one of them has a piece of paper. Oh, Damon again. <laughs> yeah. And that's what my parole officer's like. I mean, like what, I mean, my parole officer knows that they're with being my PO. She's going to have to do, Ms. Braggs is going to have to do a lot of paperwork to, to track my travel. But you know what? I'm not letting that hold me back in life. And you shouldn't let anything hold you back in, in your life either. If I've got a pee in a cup every month, pay a fine and get permission to leave the state of Texas every time I leave the state of Texas, then you are capable of doing whatever it is you have to do too. I mean, because at the end of the day, you either find a way or you find an excuse to get things done in life. And I'm curious how you were able to either, I'm curious how you were able to shed kind of a victim mentality because it is unfair how much time you got. It is, um, it is un- unfair, you know, the prison you were put into, the people you had to fight with, the like, all of it just seems so unfair. And I know you, you broke the law and all of that stuff, but most people, and I struggle with this because I've been able to work past, I think, a lot of my victim mentality. I still find myself falling into it. Um, 
But I especially notice it when I hear everyone else making complaints and excuses and not taking responsibility for stuff. And so you are just such a remarkable story. You've gone to these 300 plus locations and you've traveled and you've been to all the prisons and you've done all this stuff because you are an outlier. You are so completely different from most people who are who go through the corrections um, uh, you know, uh, process and frankly are not uh, rehabilitated at all. And I'm curious how you you shed the victim mentality. Did that come through AA? Did it come through yeah. those 12 steps? Yeah, this is the answer to your question. It comes through working a program recovery. In a program recovery, in AA, first of all, let me say, I don't speak for AA. There's going to be some old timers from AA that listen to this and they're going to get upset. Like, well, you're not supposed to talk about being in AA. No, I can talk about being in AA, but I'm going to tell you, I don't speak for AA. That's the compromise I have with the old timers in AA. I'm not a representative of AA. It happens to be the program recovery that I got into that is the way I live my life. And in a program recovery like AA, what we do is we work this thing called a personal inventory. Now, all behavior in life, this is going to, y'all, if wherever you're, if you're driving, pull over. If you're listening to this, you're somewhere you can sit down. You got to take out a pencil, pe- take out some paper. Here's what it is. All of human behavior, all the decisions we make are based around three basic instincts in life. Here they are. Your instinct for social, to belong. Your instinct for security, to have the things you need in life, to feel secure in what you do in life, and your instinct for sex, your sex instinct. I'm not talking about promiscuity and going out and seeing how many people you can sleep with. I'm talking about your instinct to mate up and have a family. And these things are inherent in us. We have a sex instinct that can be used for good. I'm not talking about the bad way. I'm talking about the good way, the procreation, the family, that kind of thing. So everything in life that happens to us, every decision we make, touches one or all three of these basic instincts in life. And what we want to do in a program recovery when we work a personal inventory is we want to plug everything in life that is a resentment into this matrix, if you will. Because I've got to plug every, if I have a resentment, now resentment is dangerous, Mark, because a resentment holds you back in life. Resentments are like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. A resentment holds you back. The opposite of resentment is forgiveness. And you want to work your way to forgive. And this means that you got to forgive everybody else too, by the way. You want to be forgiven for the things you do? You got to forgive everybody for the things they do to you, especially people that don't even ask for it and you feel like don't even deserve it. That's showing them grace. And grace is hard because grace costs a person giving it more than it costs a person who receives it. But we're going to get grace in life. We have to give grace out to other people. Now, if I have a resentment and a personal inventory, I'm going to plug the resentment into this matrix for these three different things, these three different base instincts. I'll give you an example. In my case, Judge Snipes, the judge in my trial, he's someone I used to know and hang out with before I went to trial. I used to hang out with him. Oh, yeah. I used to hang out with him. How is that not a conflict of interest? (laughs) I thought it was, too. And I just tried to get him recused, and it didn't work. And he wouldn't be recused from my case. And Judge Snipes and I didn't exactly get along great, but we hung out in the same circles. And I mean, I remember being at a bar when his dad died and bought him a drink, you know, but this is before I was a criminal and he was a criminal district court judge in Dallas, Texas. So I go into Judge Snipes' courtroom and man, this guy handles me rough and he get off my case. And he's even heard telling people that he wants to make sure Wes gets a life sentence. So after I get my life sentence, I go to prison and I'm harboring this resentment against Judge Snipes. Now you got to remember, I'm not in a program recovery. I'm sober. Because I went, I got into sobriety at gunpoint. The SWAT team did it me. That was the last day I ever drank or did drugs or anything. I'm sober, but I'm not in recovery. There's two different things. Being in a program recovery means you've dealt with everything in your life and you've kept your side of the street clean. So I don't know anything about that yet. But when I get into AA in 2011, one of the things I've got to do is work my personal inventory. That means I'm going to plug every single resentment I have in to this matrix. And here's why. My sponsor is telling me, You've got to figure out why these resentments are so strong in your life because these resentments are holding you back. We got to get rid of those today. So I said, let's plug in Judge Snipes. Big resentment I got, right? So Judge Snipes, did being in Judge Snipes courtroom get in a life sentence that affect my social instinct? You bet it did, Mark, because now I'm an ex-con. How's an ex-con going to get around in society like a normal person again? People look at ex-cons differently. Did it affect my instinct for security. You bet it did, Mark. I'm an ex-con now. There's a lot of jobs I'll never get because I've got this criminal record. I'm a felon now. 
everybody looks at felons differently. Did it affect my sex instinct? Yeah, you bet it did. I'm in a maximum security prison with all men. I don't even know when I'm getting out at this point in 2011. And when I get out, I'm an ex-con. Who wants to be with an ex-con like me? Judge Snipes, my resentment against him, touched all three of the basic instincts in life. That's why the resentment was so strong. But there's a fourth column on the personal inventory. That fourth column, it says, what role do I play? Because here's the axiom we live by in a program recovery. When I am disturbed, there's something wrong with me. When I am disturbed, there's something wrong with me. That means whatever the problem is in my life, if I have a problem with something, I have a role that I play somewhere in that problem. That's what I have to search out and find. Because if I can find the role that I play, that's the only thing I can change. That's the only thing I can work on. That's the only thing I can control, my role, because I can't control anybody else's role and stuff. So what role did I play? Well, I became a drug addict. I became a criminal. I broke into people's homes. I stole not just their property. I stole their sense of security. I broke the social contract, Mark. The social contract that says you get to live in this free society as long as you obey the rules of this free society. And when I did all those things, I landed in criminal district court seven where Judge Knights was there doing his job. This was all on me, man. Why did I have a resentment against Judge Knives when it was really me? My behaviors, my actions landed me with that license. My behaviors and my actions made me a felon for the rest of my life. That day, I got to drop Judge Snipes off my resentment list. And that's what I do with all my resentments in life. Anytime I have a problem- but don't you just shift the resentment to self-hate? No. Then you shift it no. to like, no, because then you know that, hey, look, you know what? I've got to, I've got to deal with me. Once I know that this is on me, then I can start working on that. Because if I don't want to do that again, if I don't want to be that person, you understand in a program recovery that you can't change your passage behind your passage, your lesson. You learn from it. You can teach other people with it even. <laughs> the present today is a gift. So you work in the present now to work on how do you make a better life for yourself? You're not going to be that person again, you know? So you start making better choices. You're cognizant of where your life can go if you get back into substance abuse again. That's why I keep going to my meetings. I'll go to my meetings the rest of my life. I got a sponsor I'll talk to for the rest of my life because I don't want to go back to that. But it's good to have all that stuff in your background to understand and remember where you were and where you've been. And now you don't have a resentment against yourself, but you do at the time, you got to let it go. Because I told you, the biggest resentment I ever had was against me. I had to figure out a way to forgive Damon and move forward in a program recovery. And once I could do that, then life's been great. Life's been good. I'm working in a program recovery. So you mentioned that you got um, sober uh, the moment that your windows shatter, SWAT comes in, the flash grenade goes off, you're on the floor getting cuffed. You know, that is your moment of sobriety. But recovery was three years later. What took the three years? Oh, man. So... I'm in there in prison and I'm working on trying to be a coffee bean, right? I'm trying to be this positive person and it's working to some extent. But I was laying in my bunk one night in 2011. I've got a cellmate that we live in a 10 by 12 cell, another cellmate. This isn't Carlos, a different cellmate at the time. And this cellmate of mine is a big cocaine dealer in prison. They got every drug you want to get inside of US prisons. Prisons have drugs everywhere. You can get anything you want. My cellmate is a big cocaine dealer and every night he gets high. On his own supply. And let me tell you something, man. A prison cell, a 10 by 12 prison cell, that's not the place you want to do a bunch of blow. There's just nowhere to go. You know, we had a clean cell. I mean, clean it with a toothbrush. But so he's up, jacked up one night, snorting blow, and um, he's tweaking out. And I'm laying in my bunk. I'm reading my Bible. Remember, I'm reading the Bible, Mark. And I look over at him and I'm like, you know, thinking about him doing cocaine. And I see his bowl of cocaine on the desk table in our cell. And I look at that bowl of cocaine. I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I used to love doing cocaine. I love cocaine. And maybe I can do a little cocaine again, you know? And I'm like, it just as soon as I thought it, I'm like, what am I thinking, man? I'm, I destroyed my life. I destroyed my family. By the way, my, the biggest victims in my life were my family. My family. Who I didn't just go to prison by myself. My, I went to prison. I brought my entire family with me, man. I let them down so completely. And I'm laying in my bunk with that Bible in my hand. I'm thinking, man... I destroyed my life. I destroyed my family's life. And now I'm thinking about doing a drug again. The same thing that got me in here. 
And I was like, you know what? I need help. I need more than just this Bible that I'm reading because that's not going to get me. That that's not going to give me where I want to go. Mark, there may be some people out there that the Bible does it for them by themselves. I'm not one of them. I needed more than just the Bible. I needed a program recovery. And so I dropped a request form to go to my first AA meeting. I remember when I got my, my, my hall pass, basically, it's called a, uh, a lay-in slip. And it said, be at the Chapel of Hope at 7.30 in the morning, Wednesday morning for AA and A. Mark, I know the numbers, man. I know that, that 80% of the people that are locked up have substance abuse issues. There's 3,000 people in this prison. It's a big prison, Mark. So that means 2,400 people could be at this meeting on tomorrow morning. And I'm thinking, man, the chapel's just not that big of a place. You know, I'm thinking, man, they're, it's this not going to meet- be that anonymous, will it? <laughs> no. And it's just like, man, I, I guess they're going to move us out to the rec yard. Maybe they bring some guards in from another unit because it's going to be like a Rolling Stones concert. There's going to be so many people there. When I got to the meeting the next morning, I walk into the chapel, Hope, and there's 50 guys out of the 2,400 that need to be at this meeting, 50 men decided to get up that day out of their bunk and go work on having a better life by keeping their side of the street clean. And Mark, that's when I knew I was in the right room. That's when I knew I finally found my path in life was going to be through AA and that program recovery. Because man, when you get into a room in prison and it's not where everybody's going into, you're kind of swimming against the stream. That's when you know you're in the right place. Because typically everybody's moving in one direction. That's not the direction you want to go into in a prison, man. You want to go your own direction inside that place. Otherwise, you come out and you're looking just like everybody else. And I didn't do that, Mark. That is great advice, not only for prison, but for life. And if you take the easy stream, often you'll find yourself in a destination that you didn't even plan to get to. Um, I have one more question for you. But before I hit that question, where's the best place for people to find you, to follow up with you, to hear more, to get your book? Yeah, uh, my website, damonwest.org, D-A-M-O-N-W-S-T.org. That's where people find me all over the world to come speak at their events. Uh, my books can be found anywhere where books are sold. Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, there's five different books out there. My autobiography, The Change Agent, is the one that tells the entire story. Uh, my book, The Coffee Bean, is the other one that's the real popular one. Um, social media, at damonwest 7 Instagram and Twitter. Be sure, be sure to get a copy of the book and, and to definitely dig into your YouTube channel as well. That's where I was able to get um, a lot of the lessons uh, that I was able to learn from you. And there's just really great content over there. Um, so final question for you. You mentioned your family that when you went to prison, it wasn't just, you know, that your whole family went there. You've spoken about the need for, you know, security and for status or for social connections and for sex. Um it seems to me that you know you're married now, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. You have a stepdaughter, so so check off in the. Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because I was about to say check in the sex category, but, but anyway. Oh yeah, uh, no, I mean, like, so, I mean, I've got a normal functioning marriage. I mean, that's part of it, right? I mean, but you know, when the word sex is not just about having sex, it's about no. I know it's about the intimacy. Yeah, it's the about intimacy, the connection. Right? It's about uh, the all of those things. But you know, security, social, sex. Um, you've come out on the other side. I have to wonder. What do your parents think about your transformation? Man, Mark, they're so proud of me now. And man, it feels good to make my parents proud. They came to see me over 150 times when I was in prison. I got sent to a prison that is right by the town I grew up in. So they came to see me almost every weekend. And if they weren't there to see me, they'd send some fa- or some family or friends or whatever to see me. They got to see the transformation happening while I was in prison. But when I got out, I lived with my parents for the first two years that I was on parole. I lived in their spare bedroom. And they got to see me put in the work on this life that I told them I would start when I got out. Um, and they're super proud. And it gives them hope in their life that, you know, for any challenge they go through, that if I could do it, they can do it. It's the whole power of the message, Mark. If I could do it in there, if I could turn it around so completely in the biggest pot of boiling water there is. And I say the biggest pot of boiling water, I speak to people all over the planet. You know what people tell me their biggest fear is? Going to prison. And there's a reason why. Prison is a very hard place, very dangerous place. But if I can do it in there, then you can do it out here. And that's the same thing my parents feel. It's the same thing all these audiences feel. But man, our, my parents and I, we have a great relationship now. They live 10 minutes down the road from me. I've paid them back in every way I could, financially, with good deeds, and, and everything you're supposed to whenever you're being a good person, being a coffee bean. I think if there's two things that I take away from your story, I used to say that that people can't change. <laughs> And then I realized that we can change, but that most people won't. And that makes me sad, but, but you did. You, know, you, you proved that people can change. You proved that people will change. 
Um, and the other part of it, which I really love and I hold on to often, is um, if all we did was look at your story uh, from when you were playing football, what a remarkable story. Or your, you know, your career, what a remarkable story. If we ended your story when you got sent to prison, you'd be a write-off. And if we ended your story before you got out of prison, you'd be a write-off. But but you're still writing it, right? Like, mm-hmm. like you know, the fact that you were able to turn so... Uh, for things to go so wrong, and then for you to be able to recover and turn things so right. And most likely, you're going to have some more challenges in front of you. But that really, you just have to take a really long lens, a really long look at the story to realize that there is enough time in your life and my life and our life to be able to turn these things around and make ourselves and, and those who count on us proud. Absolutely, man. And never just, I mean, don't ever stop, man. Don't stop believing in yourself. Growth follows belief. It, growth is uncomfortable, man, but you're just going to have to go through it. Because I truly believe this, Mark. On the other side of the adversity you face in life is the best version of you. But you're going to have to go through that adversity to meet that better version of you and shake their hand. Because that's who you're meant to become. 